get started. Um, it's my great pleasure today to welcome Nick Deemster uh, here to talk. Um, Nick, I've known Nick actually for a long time. Um, he was uh, an MIT lifer to start with. It is, uh, it's not really lifer anymore, but uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD all from MIT, where he graduated in 2005, and then did a, a turbo postdoc, a semester-long postdoc here at Princeton uh, with Jennifer Rexford before, uh, since 2006. Uh, he's been a professor uh, at Georgia Tech, um, now uh, uh, associate professor of uh, computer science at Georgia Tech. Um, Nick works kind of broadly in networking, from routing to network security to measurement, I'm sure some of which we'll talk about today. And over the time, um, he's collected the plethora of awards that uh, such junior faculty now uh, are, are want to do, uh, Presidential Early Career Award, Tech Review TR35, SIGCOM, Rising Star, NSF Career, ONR Investigator, um, I'm sure I missed fun, and kind of best papers at NSDI, SIGCOM, Music Security several times. Um, so uh, I think he's, he's uh, managed to show how the other bar to which many of other us junior faculty are uh, held against. Uh, anyway, uh, my pleasure, and I'm sure I'll be talking about interesting stuff today. Don't forget this. Uh, it's a security talk. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the great introduction. Uh, today I will be talking about various things that, uh, that are going on in the internet that are threatening the user's in, uh, experience in, in various ways that require sort of reaching beyond networking um, to solve, but still require a lot of domain knowledge to, to really crack. Um, networking has actually gotten very interesting uh, over, over the past uh, several years. In the beginning, of course, it, things were quite simple. Uh, the network looked like this. We could draw it on a slide. Um, uh, it was a network of trusted research universities, very few stakeholders, um, no real security concerns, and, and one government. And, and a lot of networking research really sort of focused on problems like, survi oop, like survivability, um, Looks good, looks good for me. Um, survivability, performance, um, and various other uh, sort of more traditional kind of uh, uh, um, uh, modes of research that, that sort of uh, focused on sort of knowledge of protocols and, and optimization of those types of protocols. Um, today, on the other hand, the internet's a lot more complex. Um, it's grown, of course. That's one obvious thing. Another obvious thing, or uh, at least to those who, who work in networking, is you know we're running out of resources, addresses, and so forth. We're also seeing the network expand into um, in, into new regions, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that and, and, and the implications of that um, in certain parts of the talk. Um, but actually, beyond these sort of sort of obvious changes, um, there are also um, other things going on. Um, ISPs and content providers are having it out in various ways. So if you've been following the news over the past several months, we've been seeing various spats between Comcast and Netflix and who should pay for what and who's really to blame for the user's, uh, you know, the, the performance that the user sees. These problems, as I'll point out, and as it's one of the things I'll focus on in the talk, they are technical. There are a lot of, there are, there's a lot of technical know-how that, that you need to, to sort of uh, dig into to understand those questions. But a lot of the things also, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do can in, inform things um, that are um, either economic or policy related, but yet nonetheless affect the performance that the user sees. Another thing I'll talk about is how various kinds of attackers and miscreants also seek to disrupt uh, the user's internet experience in various ways. And also increasingly we're seeing as, as the internet um, expands into countries and, and uh, regions where it previously was not, it's often going into places where things that sort of we hold as a given like uh, you know, free speech, open communication and so forth, those are not necessarily a given in, in various parts of the world. So um, networking whereas at once was, was sort of, uh, you, know, you know, one could say sort of strictly a performance and protocols discipline, now has sort, of, has sort of found the need to reach out to various other areas ranging from economics to security um, to machine learning and a, a lot of those themes I'll talk about as, as, I, as I talk through uh, various um, uh, research projects and results today. The message really, I, th I think, one of the messages is that protocols, uh, you know, working on protocols is not enough, right? So in the early days, in those pictures I showed, you know, purely technical solutions could really guarantee or at least, you know, provide reasonably good assurance that a user could see good end-to-end -end performance. But now, the, Internet's user's the Internet user's experience depends on many other factors, ranging from, you know, economics to policy to security to many other things. And yet, 
in order to understand these questions that touch other areas, we still need uh, very deep domain knowledge, deep networking domain knowledge to help inform these, these questions that do have broader societal impact. So that's kind of an uh, uh, overarching theme of a lot of the work that I'll talk about. And I'm going to focus on three, three different areas. I'm going to spend most of my effort on this first question, which is something that I've spent the last four or five years uh, really focusing on, which is those questions of, of how the ISP's incentives and how they may sort of run um, run counter to, to, to the user's incentives can threaten uh, the user's experience in various ways. And I'll talk about various systems and algorithms that we've developed to sort of safeguard the user's experience in, in the presence of those competing interests. I'll spend a little time at the end of the talk talking about other things that I've done related to both attackers and also more um, some newer work that we've been looking at in terms of how content providers and, and personalization algorithms also naturally affect the user's experience and things that we're looking at there. So in general, I just want to talk about, like, just, just briefly give an overview of the type of work that I do. So w a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is measurement related. And you'll see a lot of data, a lot of measurements, as well as some algorithms that we've layered on top of those. But, but basically, I would describe it as sort of purpose-oriented measurement in the sense that we don't basically take a data set and, and grind through it. We figure out the question or the stakeholder, in this case, stakeholders and corresponding threats that we're interested in studying. Then we actually build a system to actually gather the data that we're, that, that we're interested in, in gathering to help us answer those questions so that we can figure out how to develop countermeasures. And I'll talk about not only how we've sort of used um, you know, measurements of, of the network to inform our, our understanding of these threats, but also various things that we've done to counter those threats. And finally, another big piece of my work is closing the loop, which is in a lot of these cases, um, uh, you don't really know how well these things are going to work until you try them out in practice on a real network. And we'll see that theme sort of undercutting in various ways uh, throughout the talk. So let me kind of jump into the first uh, topic here, which is basically the, the main thing that I'm going to talk about. So here we've basically got, on one hand, users who want good, affordable, reliable connectivity to content, content and services, you know, reasonable. Um, and, you know, we have basically these basic questions, right? How can I make sure that I'm getting the download speeds that I'm paying for? Am I getting the service that I'm paying for? Something probably many of us have wondered. ISPs, on the other hand, care about other things. Uh, profit, right? And, and, and one of the things that, that ISPs may do to sort of... Um, to, to uh, improve in, increase their profit is to um, cut costs, for example, by under-provisioning or um, you know, doing various other things. This shows up in very real ways. So this is an example, and I'll talk about the system that we built to gather this kind of data. But this is basically, I think people have been following the Comcast Netflix stuff that's going on. This is data from my, my home network, and this is basically latencies, round-trip latencies, to various destinations uh, around the world. And actually, you can see this strange periodic effect those are actually latencies going up to many destinations during peak hours between basically 8 p.m. And, and midnight. And that's not just to Netflix, that's basically to everywhere. So basically what we see is <clears throat> one content provider and user behavior in terms of streaming video um, affecting the performance of the network as a whole. And as we know, right, uh, recently, right, some of these things have been resolved uh, in various ways. And a lot of the things that basically end up resolving these problems, or not as the case may be, depend on the ability of, uh, you know, the internet service providers and others reaching agreements, uh, you know, that are both uh, policy and economic related. But these are things that really show up in, 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 in real data. One of the goals, you know, one, one of the goals that I'll talk about now is basically how do we improve transparency about network performance and also develop means to improve it. So basically, how can we help users get data like this and how can we basically acquire that so that we can really understand what's going on figure out where the problems are and, and sort of better inform solutions to improve them. Okay, so I've sort of answered this already, but you know, why should we measure broadband performance? Um, well, there are obviously a number of people, like those of us in, in the room, of course, who are interested in the answers to those questions, but there are many other people as well. Users, regulators, and, um, or regulators and service providers are also very interested in these types of questions. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about, about those, those questions as we get into other things like application performance. But for example, there are, there are anecdotes that say, you know, Google's, I mean, there, there are anecdotes that tie things like Google's bottom line directly to latency, like how quickly does a search result come back. Now, um, we've all basically, well, many of us have probably seen a screen like this. We don't, some, some people, I guess, have described it and, and uh, you know, but this is speed test, right? And, and many of us sort of run this tool and we get some sort of number. Uh, 
2.07 megabits per second and we think like okay that means something like I bought five megabits per second down and I, I got 2.07 what the heck does that mean well actually as it turns out it doesn't mean very much so um, I don't have time to run this experiment here but one of the things I recently did in my class was to say okay let's all run speed tests and like like gave them a Google, Google form and said hey tell me what you got so basically in the course of like 90 minutes we had a bunch of people run run speed tests on the wireless network at, uh, in the classroom and we basically got downstream throughputs, that's the blue bars here, everything ranging from about 70 megabits per second downstream to like two or three. Okay, so the point here, um, I mean there are a number of points, like you know obviously you can take, take a lot away from that, but um, what does this number really mean? And it really, you know, it, it's, there's a lot more belief beneath the surface than basically just running a quick measurement, getting a number and being done with it. There is basically no single notion of performance, right? There are many, many things that can affect that number ranging from what kind of host did you run that test from to are there other people running, running traffic uh, you know, on the network at the same time, including, for example, other speed tests. Um, but there's no single notion of performance, right? There's, there are quest there's a question like this, which is, how is my ISP performing? Right? That's, that's one type of question. You know, is Comcast giving me the service that I'm paying for? Another question is, how's my home network performing? Right? And that, of course, again, relates to the end-to-end -end user experience, but it's a different question. That's another one that I'll touch on in, in the talk as well. And a third question that I'll touch on as well is, how are applications performing? Right? So how fast are my web pages loading? Again, these things are all related to one another, but when we're talking about the internet being fast or slow, we need to sort of tease apart that seemingly simple question and sort of break it into these pieces. Right? So we need some kind of holist more holistic understanding of what the performance looks like in the last mile and, 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 and better ways to sort of break that apart. Now I hope I've sort of like at least with that teaser given you some, you know, you know, some pause about like doing throughput measurements or speed tests from end hosts. Um, but here's another approach you know, that, I'll, that, I'll, that I'll put forth. And this is basically the focus of a lot of what we've, what, what we've done, which is sort of basically taking a new perspective on that problem. And um, I'll tell you that actually we came to this after um, having, a having a network data set dropped in our lab, which is basically like speed tests, and realizing we couldn't answer a lot of the questions we wanted to answer with it. So we basically came up with this particular system. Um, and I'll talk about basically how this works. So effectively what we wanted to do was um, deploy software at the home router. So you basically have a Netgear or Linksys router that's sitting, you know, typically, um, well in the US at least, right behind your cable modem or your DSL router or something. And from there, we can actually do some kinds of performance measurements. We can also, um, as it turns out, do a fair number of optimizations, and I'll talk about that as well. But here's, here's, here's kind of the nice aspects of it, right? One is that it's always on. Well. Okay, to a first order. Actually, as we discovered, as we, you know, when we started deploying in other countries, um, people actually treat this thing more like a television set, right? And they do turn it off. But like our, our first, uh, you know, our first, to a first, a first approximation, we can assume that it's always on. Um, the other thing that we, that we can do, right, is perform more direct measurements. So over here, we've got to worry about like, you know, what other things are on the network? What does this wireless network look like? Which turns out to be an interesting question in its own right. You know, is there other traffic going on in, in the network here? Here we have a much more direct view of actually what's going on. Not only through, you know, you know, in terms of what's behind it, but on both sides, right? So as it turns out, and as I, uh, as I start to talk about other questions, we'll see that that particular vantage point offers some, some uh, unique opportunities to answer some other types of questions. So the, the con to this approach, of course, is that as opposed to just like convincing people to go to a web page like speedtest.net and run, you know, run some kind of test, we actually have to deploy some infrastructure. So there, uh, that's hard. Right? I think there's been some history in doing that here. There's been Planet Lab and, and the like. And I would say that this sort of draws some, some similar kinds of, uh, you know, it, it, you know it, we draw some similar inspiration from that as well as we face related but different, you know, different kinds of challenges. But our approach here was to build this system called uh, Bismarck, the Broadband Internet Service Benchmark, to gather the kind of data that we wanted to answer these types of questions. Now, as I mentioned, deployment's kind of tough, right? And there are different ways to basically go about uh, standing up this type of deployment. Um, the, one of the ways that we did this was basically just sort of organic, like, uh, you know, hey, want a free router? Okay, here, it's a really good one. Uh, just run our, run, our, run our software, run our measurements, and then there you go. And uh, generally speaking, like if we talk about sort of failure scenarios, we had, you know, you know, a definite bathtub curve going on there between like the thing never being plugged in or like, you know, you know uh, pawned on eBay or something. So like once someone actually gets it plugged in, then it truly is like an always on, or at least, you know, at least as long as the internet's on, it's on. Um, and then, in, you know, so, so um, 
we were able to do that also by posting the firmware. Like there's a certain demographic of people that are happy to flash their home router to get nice graphs like the one I showed you. Um, and then in specific countries, um, I should say actually um, such as our own, um, the FCC, for example, has been very interested in this question as part of a project called Me uh, Measuring Broadband America. Um, ISPs, of course, are interested in this question as well because they want to know like, that these problems are arising, of course, like before their customers start complaining about them. So we've been, been able to engage with uh, both regulators as well as, um, as well as ISPs to get um, deployments of, of pretty reasonable sizes. Um, some of those are still ongoing, and I'll talk about how we're expanding those. Um, and then, based on some of what we did in the U.S., we were able to gather some interest from, from, from uh, uh, regulators and policy organizations in other countries um, that I've listed here in, in developing regions. And that's a particular interest that I'll talk about just briefly as I go through some results. Um, so these things are kind of all over the place. Um, it's kind of hard to get an exact count. Uh, it goes up and down, as I mentioned. Um, but one of the ways that we keep people sort of interested and engaged is by giving them these types of graphs. And we've built a whole infrastructure kind of around that as well, which basically, as, as I'll talk about in just a minute, there's, of course, a tension there because a lot of this is not research, but we need to basically do that so that we can get the data that we need and, 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 and like have the system that we need to answer the more interesting research questions. I think a lot of basically what we've done draws some experience uh, or draws some inspiration from uh, things like Planet Lab, right? And I think basically one of the, um, the themes that came out of that work is, is this idea of experience-driven experimental systems research. The idea that basically you don't really know what's going to happen um, until you basically go out there and build it. And in the process of going out there and building it and putting things out there in, in, the, in, sort of the, in the real network, you learn things that not only sort of debunk your implicit assumptions that you had, but also you give rise to sort of new ideas and, you know, and, 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 and sort of provide, open up new opportunities for, for research, uh, research ideas. Um, these are some points that came out of that, of that particular uh, paper describing that particular Planet Lab deployment, some of the lessons. And I think a lot of them resonate with our work as well. So I wanted to kind of touch on those a little bit. Like one is, of course, um, in, in order to sort of make something work, for real, you need to strive for, for simplicity, right? So one of, the, one of the things that we learned, of course, is like, okay, you could do this kind of thing by deploying, I don't know, servers or convincing people to like put some strange piece of hardware in their home, but the minute you ask them to like put a Linux box in their home or something, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa what's that? What's this thing with blinky lights and what, I have to plug it in in this strange way? Whereas if you give them something that looks like that, it's like, okay, home router, sure, I know what that looks like. I have one of those. Oh, replace it? No problem. Oh, this one's better? Great. So, um, you know, some, we, and we, we basically tried the other approach and, and actually, and, and, and failed actually to get a reasonable deployment with sort of strange looking boxes that, that did, you know, that were more fully featured. The trade-off here, of course, is that you're dealing with a box that's pretty underpowered. So I'm going to talk about the, the, the trade-offs there. Hmm? Isn't that actually a Linux box? It is a Linux box. It runs OpenWRT, but it has basically um, something like 64 megs of RAM uh, and a 500 megahertz processor and like you know 16 megs of flash storage. So it's not your uh, you know it's not your uh, standard uh, you know probably I'd have better luck with this. Um, so. This is actually a lot harder than it would seem, right? Like getting a deployment like that in a, in a way that people will swallow it, right? So there are a, a whole bunch of different challenges, right? One, you know, a bunch of challenges related to scarcity, right? So bandwidth is limited. In some places, it may be capped. Some of the places where we're trying to do these things, you know, there, there are pretty strict limits on the amount of data that one can send and receive in a particular time period. So we have to sort of balance that with our desire to get measurements. Um, another big challenge, like another big sort of theme of our challenges is that we're doing this in the wild, right? So and that's, I think, a little bit different than, um, you know, something like Planet Lab, which basically could deploy, you know, in, in uh, machine rooms on universities, right? And if a machine goes down, okay, that's, you know, that's problematic, but you, you can recover from that. And actually, in our case, if we mess something up, right, and a user basically, you know, has their internet go down, this thing's on the critical path, then basically this thing ends up in the junk pile and we, and we lose that deployment. So that's another challenge. We have to be very careful about how we, how we basically deploy, upgrade, and so forth. And then, of course, these are real users, right? These are, these are basically who people, they just want their internet to work. They're not particularly interested in our research. Um, so, um, so, you know, we, we basically need to do this in such a way that it's sort of like one touch, one install, and then hopefully you forget about it, right? So, you know, sort of bringing, you know, sort of building on these themes, we've got to balance competing objectives between like the need to keep this thing stable versus the need to do our research, right? Um, the need to keep users engaged. And also, as I mentioned, you know, the need to basically collect some data 
right? With the fact that basically we're using someone else's internet connection, right? So there's a lot of different there are a lot of different pieces that we've got to you've got to trade off here. So now I want to kind of get into like building on this sort of like you know you deploy this and you debunk, you debunk some some assumptions that you have. And I'm going to talk about some sort of highlights of results that we've that we've had in various uh, pieces of the research throughout the throughout the throughout the years that we've been doing this work. So these are things that I think you might you know ordinarily see in a networking 101 textbook and like by virtue of kind of deploying this and doing doing real things we've discovered some pretty interesting things. You know so you might learn that latency on internet paths is dominated by speed of light propagation and queuing, right? Or maybe to get better performance you know, just simply upgrade your service, uh, your ISP service plan to a higher speed. That should fix the problem. And of course, like every time the performance is poor, our first reaction is to just call up the ISP and complain, right? Because it's probably their fault. Turns out that all these, like, you know, are, are you know, um, partially untrue, I will say. Um, and I'll go through and sort of highlight things that basically indicate that they're a lot more nuanced than we might think. Let me talk about a few things that impact or affect latency and why latency is so, so important and what we can do about it. One of the things that we sort of looked at was basically how do, how do latencies vary depending both on ISP but also on, in terms of access technology. And one of the things that, that came up, of course, uh, well, that, that, the, that the plot shows here is that your, the choice of your access technology, access, technology, access technology, DSL or cable, can actually affect the latencies that you see. And actually what we saw here was kind of exactly the opposite of what you were reading and the, the opposite of what we expected was that, oh, cable, shared medium in the last mile, congestion, you'd expect a lot more variable performance. And we saw actually exactly the opposite. Um, we actually saw in many cases DSL links providing ridiculous high, ridiculously high latencies on just like the first hop into the ISP. Um, why does this happen? Okay, it actually basically uh, comes down to a trade-off with error correction, right? And actually as DSL providers such as AT&T, for example, they started basically putting uh, television and other things over the, over, over the IP links in the last mile. They care about error. So it turns out there are two different ways that you can configure your last mile on a DSL link. One is called fast path, and that's sort of, you know, uh, as you might expect, faster. Um, the idea here is that, you know, suppose you've got three packets, right, and, uh, you know, red, orange, and blue. And in order to receive any, you know, any packet correctly, you need to receive, this is a simplified version of error correction, right? Let's say you need to, to receive two of the three chunks, right, to, to basically successfully decode the packet. Well, if you get a burst loss, which is very common on a noisy DSL link, you know, the, 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 the line can be, you know, the, the link is very susceptible to this type of thing, and a burst loss can cause a packet to be lost, okay? Well, the trick that many DSL providers play Right, is to interleave the packets and, and uh, to interleave the code words in, this, in, the, in the following way so that if you get the same kind of burst loss, well, you can still get two out of three, three packets received, but the cost that you pay for that is more delay, right? So this shows up, right? I mean, we, we can, this shows up in our, our, our results. It also shows up in places like uh, forums where you have surprised users upgrading from AT&T DSL to AT&T Uverse, right? Where, um, you know, that's a triple play thing, for example. And, uh, Oh, faster. Why is my ping time, I'm a gamer, why is my ping time suddenly higher? Well, oh, didn't, th you know, didn't know about this type of thing, right? So surprises abound. Another case where, peer, uh, where latency shows up, and this has shown up particularly as we've done this in developing regions, is peering between internet service providers. So what I've shown here, it's a little bit small to read, but what I've shown is basically these are um, latencies from um, Nodes that, it's the average latencies from uh, uh, routers that we've deployed in South Africa to different um, destination servers in different different cities around the world, and these are ordered by distance from South Africa. Okay, so on the on the left we have Johannesburg, right, and and over here we have Los Angeles, and we've got other things in between which are actually kind of important. So let me just point out, um, you know, here we've got Kenya, actually, um, and Brazil, right, and over here. We've got Amsterdam and London. So these are ordered by, dis, by geographic distance. You know, in a, in a speed of light world, you'd expect these bars to kind of go up and to the right, right, as we go up sort of monotonically. But something weird is going on here. And actually, you can see that latencies from South Africa to Kenya, which is not that far away, are actually twice as high as the latencies from South Africa to Amsterdam or London. So uh, any guesses for why that might be the case? Yes. Um, good, good answer. Might have been, might have been the case like ten years ago, but actually, this isn't, this isn't satellite. 
Correct. Exactly. So London and Amsterdam are basically, there's links, the London Internet Exchange, and then there's Amsterdam Internet Exchange, two of the biggest internet exchanges in the world. Um, they happen to be places where not only do the African ISPs prefer to connect to one another, but actually, as it turns out, it's also a place where they prefer to host their content. So there's a lot of strange stuff going on here. So um, this, by the way, is also true to, to other places. So there's very strange uh, uh, peering or lack thereof going on. So here's an example of something that, this is kind of like, you know, something that we've uncovered in some published work, but there's definitely more to be done here, which is like, how do we fix this problem, right? There are various technical fixes, right, such as placing, uh, you know, cache content in different places. There are also questions you could ask about, well, why aren't these ISPs connecting to one another locally? Why aren't they choosing to host content locally and so forth? So that's sort of um, an interesting uh, surprise as well. Another interesting surprise, and this one came as a, as a personal surprise, because uh, this one actually caused me to change my own modem. Uh, so any, you may have experienced this yourself, like sometimes you upload a video to YouTube and suddenly your web performance goes, you know, goes down the toilet, right? So as it turns out, um, we, can see, we can see basically here wh ex exactly why that's happening. So here we're looking at last mile latency, uh, like last mile round trip time to like the first hop I should say the round trip time to the first hop inside the ISP. At time 30 here, we basically start an upload on the link, right? So you basically have an under-provisioned uplink, and then um, suddenly latency goes high. Well, we know that this isn't speed of light. It's only on one other thing, right? It's, it's got to be buffering, right? Um, and it turns out there's a fair amount of buffering in the modem, right? So um, here, this is a log scale, right? So we're going from like a server, you know, round trip times to, in this case, like a, a, a destination that's about 10 milliseconds away, and suddenly latencies go up to a second. So if you're wondering why your, your web connections or your TCP connections are slowing down, here's a good reason. Well, it actually gets worse than that. Um, uh, so depending on the modem that you pick, actually, and I actually have the green one. I switched to the red one, uh, which still isn't good. Uh, but you can see, basically, that your, your choice of equipment actually has a huge effect. Okay, so done with the first assumption. The next assumption is, you know, that, you know, to get better performance, you could, you could, you know, simply upgrade your, your service plan to a faster speed. That should help, right? Um, well, this is basically a graph showing the time it takes to load, to load different web pages, um, and I'm going to skip over the details there. As it turns out, just a simple question such as, uh, how do I measure web page load time? turns out to be a complicated question, but I'll skip over that in this talk and just sort of, um, let's, let's assume that I have a way of measuring that. And you can see basically, if I plot that on, a, and this is a log scale here, if I plot that against the throughput, and this is as I've measured it, right? So now we use our, this, the work that we've done before, we measure the downstream throughput, and we say, okay, well, what happens to web page loads as throughput increases? And you can kind of see, this is a log scale, right? So this is a lot flatter than it looks. Page load times really stop improving, right? And on the other hand, that last mile latency stuff that we just looked at really, uh, really kind of hurts, right? So we can see that as the last mile latency kind of, you know, it can, it increases, the page load times also go up. Okay, so why is this going on? Well, we know, for example, and this is something that, that, that again, sort of people have looked at web, uh, you know, web performance. It's not a new topic. People have been studying this for 20, 25, probably more, um, uh, maybe even longer. So. Um, uh, but um, but uh, essentially, the web has, has changed quite a bit in recent times, right? So objects are small, right? It used to be the case that, like, you know, we download one chunk of HTML and that was the end of the story, right? Well, for the same reason that measuring it has gotten harder, it's also like become a lot more bound by other things besides throughput, right? So we're opening up a lot of connections to download very small objects, often just a, you know a few kilobytes, right? So now suddenly something that was you know, throughput bound becomes latency bound because we can't fill the pipe, right? We're basically bound by the time it takes to do DNS lookup, right? And resolve the name to the IP. Or we're bound by the time it takes to basically do these round trips to open up our TCP congestion window. So last mile latency can hurt. And this is a place where we've done some work to say like, not only does it, you know, well, it can hurt, but actually we can do something about it as well, right? And again, here, this is sort of like old tricks in new places, right? What are the types of things we do in computer science to kind of improve performance of systems like caching, prefetching? We can play those games all over again, but we can use the knowledge that we just gained from our study of, of latency in the last mile to say, well, if we can just move certain things that are latency bound to the home side of the, of the access link instead of the other side of the last mile, then we can significantly improve uh, performance. And actually, we don't have to prefetch the page, right? In fact, that's not even possible because so much content is dynamic. But just doing things like figuring out which 
uh, domains people go to, which are, you know, what are, what's popular in that particular home, and then prefetching those DNS records, or keep, like, pre-opening TCP connections to places that we can predict people are going to go to, significantly improve the performance. Okay. So finally, I'll talk about this, this last assumption, which is, you know, when performance is bad, it's, you know, it's probably usually the ISP's fault. Well, we wanted to question that a little bit, right? And the question, of course, is like, well, where is the bottleneck? Is it actually, is it really the access link or is it somewhere else, right? We know that, why, you know, well, we think that Wi-Fi, you know, can be bad. We've experienced that. So let's actually try to measure that, right? And the issue here is, of course, like, there are various ways that you can try to, you know, measure that from a client or a server or various points along the path. But it's very tough to, to do that from certain locations. On the other hand, if we're sitting right at the router, the home router, which we already are, by the way, because we've been doing all these other studies, this provides a tremendous opportunity because we're at this cool point. On one side, we can see the access link. On the other side, we can see the wireless network. So we're at a point where we can differentiate what's going on on either side of the connection and sort of exploit the router's vantage point to locate some of these performance bottlenecks. So, we're keeping in mind, right, that we've basically got to solve this problem on a very constrained piece of hardware, right, and, and so we're looking for things that can do this in real time using very lightweight metrics, and it turns out we can kind of use our intuition to do some pretty simple things, and then it's a matter of kind of like turning the crank on, on, um, on sort of detection, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but here's, sort of, here's some bits and pieces of intuition. So, let's suppose that the, that, the, uh, that the home router is on this side, right, and the access link is up here, and the, you know, we want to see whether th that this particular link is bottlenecked. Well, the, intu the intuition here is kind of like water going through a funnel, right? So, you know, if you've got, if you've got packets coming in at a, at a higher rate than the, this link can drain, we can observe things about the inner arrival time of the packets as they leave this link, right? So, you know, imagine this being a funnel, right, with a narrow link and water coming through. Well, this is basically going to drain at a very even rate. If this is not a bottleneck, right, you can imagine, you know, by contrast, say, like putting water droplets through a funnel, then those are going to drop through at whatever rate they came through, right? So the intuition here is basically that, you know, on a bottleneck link, we see smooth departures. Well, that's fine, but, you know, you know obviously other people have observed that, but actually we can take advantage of that observation right here because we're sitting right on the other side of the bottleneck. We're not at some weird place inside the home. We're actually right at the point where packets come in, right? So we can use that observation at the router to basically figure that out. Okay, the other thing that we can see basically is that buffering here actually can also lead to, to in, 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 in increased round trip times on the end-to-end -end path. That's, that's something also that, sh that shows up that we can use as well. That shows up sort of uh, very clearly if you sort of look at basically the, this is instantaneous throughput on the, uh, on the y-axis and time on the y-axis. And um, this is basically a proxy for packet inner arrival times, right? And you can see basically here, um, this is a, an artificial, I mean, I should say a contrived experiment that we've done in the lab where we basically introduced the bottleneck. And we basically can see that in fact, yes, not only of course like is the, is the actual in instantaneous throughput lower as we would expect, the access link is the bottleneck, but also the coefficient of variation in the case when it's, when it's the bottleneck of the packet inner arrival times is a lot lower. Right, so we can use that. Um, so that's the access link side, you know, just um, a flavor of the types of things we can do. On the wireless side, another thing we could do is sort of look at the round trip times between the access point and the device inside the network. You would expect those to typically be pretty low, right, because the devices are right there. Um, but in fact, Various things such as contention on the wireless, um, uh, interference, other things that can cause, cause problems, uh, you know, microwaves, baby monitors, etc., can actually cause retransmissions at lower layers, pa uh, packet losses, uh, frame losses, I should say, that um, at higher layers can be reflected as higher round trip times. Okay, so that's all well and good. I've shown you sort of some intuition and some numbers, and basically what we want to do is kind of formalize that. Right, and what we, in, in this here we can use kind of like standard detection theory, right? So we've got random variables. In one case, it's like you know the coefficient of variation of the packet inner arrival time. In the other case, it's it's LAN RTT. And what we can do is basically, you know, there's a dis, there's basically a statistical distribution over those variables given a prior like okay, the access link is a bottleneck, right, or the access link is not the bottleneck. So we can pick a detection threshold that gives us a fairly good detection and false positive rate. And as it turns out, we can actually do that. We can do that so that we get a, you know, um, 98, 99% detection rate for a less than 1% false positive rate in this case. Here are the thresholds in case you're interested. This is sort of the thing. This is the system. It's called WTF, a question I think we've all asked. Where's the fault? Of course. Um, 
And uh, we've basically put this in about 80 homes on our, on our current test bed. And now basically um, uh, the uh, FCC also has an independent study that they've been conducting where they've basically got routers deployed in something like 4,000 homes. And we've, we've, we're now basically deploying that in that, um, in that uh, 4,000 node deployment as we speak. Um, I'll just show you briefly some of the stuff that we're, that we're looking at, uh, or some of the results from the, from the 80 nodes where we've deployed. Um, this basically shows on the y-axis, I'll just sort of uh, parse it in lay terms. This is fraction of time that the wireless is basically the bottleneck. And on the x-axis, this is fraction of time the, that we detect an axis link bottleneck. And the size of the circle here, the, 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 the diameter is basically the um, downstream throughput as we've measured it, right? So you'd expect, of course, that like for tiny circles, i.e. very small downstream throughput, that of course we're going to see axis link bottlenecks, and that's what we see. But what's really kind of surprising is that the wireless bottlenecks for these things basically start to show up uh, more and more, especially as throughput increases, um, and that these access link bottlenecks are, is of, of course, rare. So this is something that bears further study. As I mentioned, we're, we're basically doing a large in-home deployment with the FCC now on this, uh, you know, on this exact uh, topic. But basically what we can see in our cases, uh, right, is that, you know, as throughput uh, you know, in, in, with down, downstream throughput to the home, you know, starts to exceed like 35 megabits per second. We're not, we're not there yet for everybody, right? But, but someday we'll get there. Um, you know, it almost, you're almost never seeing access link bottlenecks, at least not right now, right? So this is obviously something that regulators and such care a lot about because if we're talking about investments, right? And basically, what's the point of deploying gigabits to the home if the access link is the bottleneck? So they're very important kind of policy questions as well here. So. These are some you know, summary of some new things that we've discovered, right? And then, of course, the other theme there was that not only are we discovering these, these um, I should just like you know recap that a little bit, right? Not only are we discovering these these new uh, these new things that we didn't know, right? But also in the process of doing this, we've 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 had to, we've sort of come across new research, right? So you know, okay, the last mile latency is bad. Let's figure out ways. Let's think about ways to improve that. Right? Well, oh, we've got this weird peering problem like in, in developing regions. Well, there's you know, interesting you know, uh, questions in, you know, ranging from you know, cash placement and technical problems to work on there from economics and regulation that we can, that we can start thinking about. And I, f I feel quite strongly about that um, to the point that basically we've basically released all of the data, all the code for everything that, we, that we've done here, not only that, so that we can work on it, but the, so that others can work on it as well. Okay, so another question, another sort of topic, of course, is that not only can ISPs under provision, but they can also discriminate against traffic. And this is sort of like coming to the forefront again. Like there was a recent uh, court ruling, a circuit court ruling that said um, on, the, on this whole net neutrality debate, right, the question is can ISPs give preferential treatment to certain types of traffic? And the court's answer, at least, you know, for now, right, this may change, right, but the, at the moment, like the answer is yes, this is fine, except you need to be transparent about what you're doing, right? So if you're going to discriminate against certain types of traffic, you, you at least need to tell the user about that. Well, um, that's interesting. How do you actually do that? Um, and that's basically the, the, the goal of, 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 the, of the next piece of work that I'll talk about is how do you basically provide this type of transparency um, for the user? Um, um, so um, what we want to answer basically is is, is, is Comcast, let's, so, the, so the question here is like, is Comcast basically responsible for uh, the lower BitTorrent throughput that I see? That might be one, one question, right? Another question is, you know, you might ask the same question about streaming, right? So, okay, well, I might say, well, if I have Comcast, I see five megabits per second on my BitTorrent throughput, and if I don't, then I have 10 megabits per second. Does that, uh, does that mean that Comcast is discriminating against BitTorrent? Not necessarily, right? Because there are many other factors that can correlate, uh, you know, not, not only other factors that can affect this, but also some that correlate with my, my choice of ISP, right? So, um, you know, for example, like, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, I, I, I test against the Comcast or the Princeton network, right? Well, maybe I'm at Princeton, I'm, I'm doing all my, you know, traffic during the day, and maybe at Comcast it's at night, right? So there's a confounder, right? And statistically, we call these things that correlate with, with the, the choice of, you know, with the, with the variable that we're trying to test. We call those confounders. And we'd like to sort of isolate those, right, so that we can basically figure out, um, is there a causal effect between what ISP I put here and what throughput value I get here? So I'd kind of like to sort of isolate away these things. It turns out, actually, that um, outside of networking, people have done this. Right? So 
this is a standard question in clinical trials, right? Do, do you know, does aspirin make you healthy or, or what have you, right? And the standard approach here is to do something called random treatment. So you basically take some population, right? Some people are sick, some people are healthy, right? And you, you treat them randomly, irrespective of their initial health, right? So you take some population here, you treat some of them, you leave some of them untreated, and then you basically observe, well, how, what fraction of the you know, treated population is healthy versus you know, the untreated population. And if you do this sort of random treatment approach, you can measure what's called association, and the causality theory basically says that association basically converges to the causal effect if the confounders don't change like while you're doing this, right? So there are obviously other confounders that, that could, could disrupt this, but, but uh, that's basically the theory. And um, that's all well and good, except the problem is that random treatment, in, in the case of ISP testing, requires changing your ISP. And, and we can't obviously say, hey, would you mind changing your ISP for an hour? We'd like to sort of test your bit torrent throughput. So what we do, we build this system called NANO, and this stands for uh, Network Access Neutrality Observatory. And the idea basically is, well, you can approximate this notion of random treatment if you enumerate your confounders. So here's basically kind of like where statistics meets domain knowledge. So what are the things that could possibly, you know, confuse those measurements? Well, it could be like, you know, the operating system that I use. It could be basically, you know, whether or not compression is turned on or, 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 or any, of these, any of these factors. So if we can enumerate those, then we get a number, you know, we get a large enough set of users in each of those, um, what we call strata, which are basically, um, um, groups where all of those confounders are held constant, then we can basically measure the association in the same way that we did, like in the same way that random treatment works, and you get the same theoretical result, which is basically that that, that association uh, converges to causal effect. Okay, so that we sort of tackle that first problem, which is random treatment doesn't quite work. We can sort of get around that with stratification. Right? Um, there are a few other things that you've got to do, right? So one is like, you can measure association, right? Like what's the performance of, you know, you know, for this group of users with Comcast versus like not Comcast. Well, what's the definition of not Comcast? I don't know. Like one answer is that we basically take a baseline which is the average performance of the other ISPs. There may be other ways to do that, but that's of course a, another sort of challenge or, or sort of, uh, you know, approximation that we needed to do to solve this problem. Then of course there's the enumeration of confounders, which is, 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 is itself tricky, right? And that of course just, you know, that's where again requires some domain knowledge. Um, and then finally, of course, we've got to collect a lot of data, um, right? And this basically, this approach depends on having a lot of data. So you'd probably need to do this in the, in the context of either having a lot of vantage points or being an ISP or something. In this case, we basically uh, validated this in the lab, um, right? So we basically had an access ISP. Um, then we emulated a bunch of ISPs in EmuLab. Um, our service providers, right, the things like hosting web, or whatever, we're on Planet Lab, and then we used like we we ran HTTP and BitTorrent over this way, and then um, inside these ISPs here that we were that we were hosting in an emulated environment, we used the click router to basically do a bunch of things like throttling, dropping, and so forth. And we saw, you know, and we introduced our own confounders to see whether or not we could we could uh, you know detect these types of things. And we did different types of experiments: simple discrimination against web traffic, you know, discrimination against long-running services, right? Like, are you a heavy user? After a certain point, I'm going to throttle you. Um, you know, bit torn and so forth. And the, 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 um, the, res the idea here is basically that you should see this sort of causal, this causal effect, or here we're measuring association, but it's, you know, it converges to this causal effect. And you can see that show up quite clearly. Um, um, okay, so that concludes the first topic, and, and that's basically the meat of the talk. And now I just want to touch on a couple other things that relate to this theme. Um, another um, stakeholder, uh, if you will, that threatens user experience is attackers, and, and they, of course, do this in various ways, right? Another topic that we've worked a lot on is spam, right? So um, this number, of course, you know, that changes depending on who you ask, um, but basically there's a lot of it. Okay, ways to get around that. You could filter, right? And the common approach to doing this is basically, um, or the conventional approach, I should say, is you could look at content. Now, the problem with looking at content is there are many different ways to encode a message. Right, so if you talk to the people who run spam filters at Google or, or Yahoo or, or, or whoever, they'll tell you that, you know, that there's something like 90,000, well this is maybe a year or so ago, maybe more now, 90,000 different ways to spell Viagra, okay? Um, but also these messages show up in, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in various contexts. So right, this is a cat and mouse game that, that we're sort of bound to lose because the minute we figure out how to filter spam and PDFs, the Excel speech come and the MP3s come and so forth. And that's sort of, that's, that's sort of a cat and mouse game where we're constantly behind. Another is basically 
of course, a mail server's got to connect to you and, and like so that basically you're going to establish a TCP connection and send mail and so forth. Um, and, and the problem there is that the IP addresses keep changing, right? And that's basically some, something we discovered through our, our own work as well. There are many possible reasons why, you know, you see new IP addresses sending email. Um, but, the, but the practical problem for our purposes is that how do you build a blacklist when new IP addresses are always coming online sending email? So that's, that becomes a real challenge. So the approach that we took to this problem is sort of more of a, a network-centric lens, which is to say, like, let's, instead of looking at, like, um, you know, what's being sent or who's sending it, let's instead look at, like, how it's being sent and how we can observe various network traffic patterns, and let's see kind of what stands out. The intuition here is that spammers basically aren't like us, right? They're sending mail in different ways, and the, way, the reason they have to do that is fundamental, right? They've got to send a lot of spam to a lot of people so that they, they can make money because not everyone's buying, and the, the yield rates are very low. Other things that are going on, right, and I'll talk about how we take advantage of these, right, is that spammers have to move to escape detection, right? Like, if they constantly send from the same place, they're going to end up on a blacklist, right? So they need to move. Well, that's kind of irritating, but on the other hand, we can use those, we can observe those dynamics and recognize that those dynamics look different than normal network dynamics and kind of take advantage of that. So let me just talk about that one first. Um, then I'll talk about another sort of uh, feature that stands out, which is that spammers actually, um, spam traffic tends to exhibit coordination patterns. Um, and one of, the, one of the pieces of work that, that we did that I won't talk about is that sending behaviors coordinate, but actually other stuff coordinates too. And I'll show you something that's, that's quite fun. Um, and then finally is, is just sort of the, the last thing that we can look at here is that just the, like sending patterns just don't look the same at all. So let me talk briefly about uh, this question of how spammers use internet infrastructure to kind of move around and, 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 and how we can detect that. So one of the things that we've observed is that spammers can use the internet um, routing infrastructure to briefly advertise um, network address space, launch an attack, if you will, in this case it's spam, right, um, and then disappear, right. So this sort of like uh, um, uh, uh, flies in the face of the assumption that, well, you know, as long as someone makes a TCP connection to me, of course I can trace them back, right? Well, it turns out you can't, right? Because you see this, this sort of behavior where a route comes online, right? I'm advertising a particular block of IP addresses. Then I see attack traffic from that range of IP addresses, and then it disappears. Okay, so, um, you know, of course, if we know how to look for this thing, uh, we, we know how to look for these types of things, we can use that, the, these types of dynamics as signals for detection. But let me just leave you with one other surprise um, before, bef you know, before moving on, which is that you might expect, actually, that you know, these, these uh, ranges of IP addresses that are being stolen would be small, right? You know, because small, less likely to you know, raise alarms. In fact, they were huge, right? One, two, fifty-six of the entire internet, right? Slash eights. Okay, and this is another thing where, again, um, sort of not what you might expect, but again, if you sort of like your, your networking 101 will sort of, ex you know, uh, once you think about it, will, it, it, it suddenly makes sense, right? Because if you think about, if I'm an attacker and I don't want to disrupt existing networks, actually, if I advertise shorter prefixes, right, these, you know, slash eights instead of slash 24, right, the less specific announcement will always lose. Right? So the people who live inside these spaces, right, the other ISPs with smaller blocks, they can continue to route happily, nothing's disrupted. On the other hand, as an attacker, I've basically got this huge range now. Okay, so on the one hand, that's, you know, that creates problems, like because uh, suddenly a huge chunk of the internet has been sort of co-opted for, for these types of attacks. But if we can observe these types of dynamics, that again gives us another clue or another signal into basically getting a step ahead. And that's, that's something that actually we've been working on in, in ongoing work is sort of how do we sort of uh, to move this towards detection. Another piece of the infrastructure that, that spammers can use to achieve a, uh, this kind of agility is, is the naming system, right? So the DNS, the way that, that we map names to IP addresses also um, can be used to move around, right? The obvious, the obvious thing here is like I can take a name and then I can map it to a different IP address. And if I move, I change that mapping. Change, change, change. Right, well, um, normal web services, of course, change IP addresses as well, right? Load balancing and other things. But one thing that actually doesn't change very much is um, in the DNS, there's a hierarchy, right? And as you move up the hierarchy, there are things called authoritative name servers. So for example, for Princeton.edu, there are servers that are responsible for resolving cs.princeton.edu and www.cs.princeton.edu and so forth. And 
those authoritative services, say for Princeton.edu or say Google.com or whatever, those tend not to change very often. That's infrastructure, right? On the other hand, if I'm a spammer running my domain, my name resolution off of a you know network of large compromised machines, that stuff is likely to move around, and that's exactly what we see. This is a distribution a CDF of inter-arrival time between the changes between um, the mappings between the authoritative name server and the IP address that's, that's authoritative for that. So here we basically see for these bad domains, these 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 uh, these domains that have this this property called flux. Um, uh, about, you know, nearly half of them actually exhibit some kind of change about once every six hours or so. And, and you can see that sort of the legitimate uh, domains actually do not, ex do not exhibit this behavior at all. Another thing that we saw, and this is actually some work that, that we, that, you know, here you've got to have a special vantage point to see this, but if you're VeriSign, for example, um, or happen to have friends at VeriSign, then you can see this. Um, so another thing that, that turns up is you can look at lookup patterns. Okay, so let's say you register a new domain name, like your, you know, your blog or website or company or what have you. You register it. And, um, what happens to that domain in the first week after, after you're registering it? Like, who looks it up? Um, probably nobody, right? So, um, right? so, and that's kind of what we see here. This is basically the number of distinct slash 24, less, slash 24 networks that are looking up that domain name within a week after it's being registered. And you can see that actually the bad domains actually... Um, many of them get fairly popular in a fairly widespread uh, fashion, right? These are hundreds of distinct networks looking up that domain within, within a week of when the, when the, when the um, domain was registered. Um, so um, to close the loop on that, obviously you can use those types of things to build detectors, and that's, that's that some of the, the work in sort of moving those towards detection. Some of that we've done, and some of the things like domain reputation is, is, is work that's, that's ongoing as well. Um, Here's another property, which is that spammers tend to coordinate um, with one another. Um, and I mentioned the sending coordination that can pop up. But another thing that happens, actually, is that spammers send spam to themselves. Okay? Um, and you might think, well, that's kind of strange. Why would a spammer want to receive spam? Um, actually, another thing that's going on with webmail, right, is we've seen these buttons like not spam, right? So you go into the spam folder, you can say, hey, wait a minute, that's not spam. So spammers like to actually send spam to themselves so that they can vote on it. Okay? So, uh, when they send spam to themselves, right, then they can say, wait a minute, your classifier said this is not spam, right? So, you got that wrong. Um, okay, so this, of course, really confuses uh, the webmail uh, spam detectors, right? Because this is a false pot, this is an indicator of a false positive, which is, of course, very bad. This is, you know, the job offer that you want that basically went into the spam folder. Um, Let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, but uh, so you can see, um, you know, basically here the goal is to basically detect this happening, right? Okay, so um, here's the trick, right, is that detecting any individual not spam vote is, you know, tricky, right? But uh, actually coordination uh, emerges if we sort of look more broadly. And this is something that we did with, with Yahoo, actually. So you've, you've, you've obviously got to have a special data set to do this. Now I've illustrated this and I've modeled this as a bipartite graph and I've shown it as red and green just for the sake of illustration. But in our actual detection, obviously we don't know who's who, right? But, but I'll show you basically how we get there. This is the behavior that we're modeling and then here's how we detect it, right? So on the left of the graph here, we have uh, user identities, right? So these are basically accounts or email addresses. And, and on, the, on the right, um, and we have, you know, legitimate users and we have bad users, right? You know, spammers, if you will, uh, who have, you know, uh, you know, have their own accounts. On the right, we have legitimate servers, uh, uh, we have legitimate servers and we have uh, uh, legitimate IP addresses that are sent, you know, that are senders and we have spam IP addresses. The arrows represent not spam votes. Okay. So what's going on here, what we can see are a couple of things. Is the, 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 you know, the, the good guys, occasionally they may cast a not spam vote, right? You know, maybe one, right? But the bad guys cast a lot of not spam votes, so that's one thing. And the other thing that they do is if you look at any particular bad IP address right, that's sending, it has a lot of incoming arrows, right? Um, so it has a lot of not spam votes cast for it. And where are they coming from mostly are bad guys. Okay, now there's, okay, so you see the relationship there, which is that these guys are voting on a lot of, you know, you know bad, they're voting not spam on a lot of, you know, bad servers. And the bad servers have, have a lot of not spam votes. There's a circularity there. Of course, we can break this. Right? We take this bipartite graph and we look for connected components with graph-based clustering. Right? So the idea is basically we can represent this bipartite graph as k-neighborhood graphs 
right? And by adjusting our value of k, of course, we can basically, f that's how basically we tune our, our detection, right? Now, the issue there is that doesn't work quite perfectly because, you know, occasionally there are, ca you know, there are cases where, you know, you've got people who are mostly doing good things and you have one person with a compromised machine and they run off and they log in, you know, they log in from some strange, you know, mail proxy when they're traveling and that, that causes the, you know, that can cause a whole cluster to be labeled bad. So, um, there we, be, you, we can use various machine learning tricks to sort of break the clusters. We can break the users into things called canopies and then we do graph-based clustering within each one of those clusters to, to sort of get a handle, like get much better control over the false positives. This, by the way, is um, not my area of expertise. So, you know, we work with machine learning people to sort of identify the right methods. But this is another example of something where this is a real problem, a real network security problem. We need domain knowledge to sort of crack it. Off-the-shelf machine learning doesn't quite work, but we can basically use, you know, use our domain knowledge and apply that to, to, to solve these real problems. Um, okay, so I just want to um, take the last minute or two to talk about this sort of new, newer problem area that I'm working on. This is, is you know, uh, content providers as stakeholders and, and how content providers and personalization can affect user experience in various ways and things that we're doing about that. So, personalization itself can act, can itself be a filter, right? So online personalization affects things that we see, right? It affects our search results. It affects what we see in a Facebook news feed. It affects the products that, that are recommended to us. It affects the movies that are recommended to us and so forth. That's the best case scenario, right? I mean, there are these, there are these things that have been discussed by social scientists like filter bubble, right? Where we kind of see things that match our own interests. That's actually the best case scenario. It turns out actually that this can also be exploited, right? There's a personalization algorithm. Right, when you type in a search, right, so for example here, this is a search for uh, shoes, okay? Well, in the best case scenario, you get some results. It's ba your, the results are based on your profile. Here I've put nothing, there's nothing in the user profile right now. What I'm gonna do is pollute uh, the user profile in a second. You can see here, I'm, I'm gonna show you basically a specific, uh, we're looking for a particular uh, result, which is on the second page. Okay, so here we're looking for uh, Macy's. Okay, so that result is on the second page, right? And this is, these are my search results. Now I'm gonna move that to the first page. Okay, so the way that we do that is we, you know, we've got to induce a user to visit some other site. In this case, this is ours. So what we did is actually, we polluted the user profile just by causing them to go to our site. If you go to basically now the user's search history, all of a sudden, there's stuff in here. Wait a minute, Macy's shoes, Macy's women's shoes, Macy's shoes. We did that with something called a, a cross-site request, right? So if you're logged into Google, Right? You can, uh, any domain can issue a cross-site request, right? And we can use those cross-site requests to pollute your profile. And you can see now, when I search for shoes, Macy's is right there on the first page. So this is something where we basically looked at how web vulnerabilities actually can sort of move their way up the stack and also not only affect, you know, the, the traditional things that we look at, but also things like your search results. Another thing that we've been looking at there too is to look at sort of how search results are inconsistent across both geography, profile, and so forth. Um, and this is, this, is, uh, this is, again, sort of ongoing work, but we've sort of built a system that, uh, on top of Planet Lab, right, and can search for, you know, um, uh, somebody like Jen, uh, and, and, you know, I get a certain set of results. Um, nice picture. Uh, and, but you can see um, that there are other results here that I, that I don't get, right? So the idea here is basically, we, t we have this plugin, we take that search result, and then we re-execute it using different user profiles. In this case, we're mainly using geography, right, in the case of this plugin. So we use Planet Lab as, a, as an agent to basically say, okay, what happens when I issue this query here? What happens over there, et cetera? The paper talks about some other things as well, which are like, you can look at how discrepancies arise when you're logged in versus logged out and so forth. This is, again, sort of an ongoing area where we've really just scratched the surface. Um, there's actually a, a tool that we've built. Uh, it's a Chrome plugin called Bobble, and you can you can uh, you can check that out. Um, okay. So in summary, I've talked about like that that how user experience, you know, in the, in the old days, if you will, depended a lot on you know you know almost exclusively on protocols. But now it's depending on a lot of different stakeholders, right? How ISPs agree or don't agree on how to connect or interconnect or treat each other's traffic, um, the presence of attackers, the presence of personalization, all these things require. Um, you know, uh, sort of 
deep networking domain knowledge to help solve these problems, but they also require kind of an outward focus. And that's, that's an ongoing theme of my work. So in the future, I'm looking at basically how other stakeholders can affect user experience. We're looking at um, censorship quite a lot, how authoritarian governments can affect what you can or can't reach. Um, not only both can you reach it or not, but what's the performance to that or not. So to sort of riff on the web performance work, right, we can ask whether a site is reachable or not, but another question is, well, it might be reachable, but maybe the government has made the performance so bad that users don't want to go there. And that's sort of a form of censorship that we'd like to sort of uncover, and we can build on our past knowledge and understanding of web performance. And finally, another area that I'm looking at a bit more is digging a bit more into those, those questions of what does internet performance look like in developing regions, right? I gave you one teaser on that. Um, and how do we basically, you know, wh what kind of steps can we do to make the, you know, to improve the user experience in those cases? So, uh, that's the end for now. Thanks for listening. I should say there was like a lot going on there, and you can you can not you can probably imagine it was not entirely me. Um, there are a lot of students who deserve a lot of credit for this. Um, in particular, um, Makaram is quite a machine learning expert. Srikant and Sam uh, did a lot to 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 sort of build the platform that I talked about, and these folks in the middle have worked a lot on the spam and domain uh, reputation problems that I talked about. And also, of course, um, a lot of the work is not just networking focused, as I mentioned, draws on expertise in people from a variety of different areas, including machine learning, security, and, and, and theory in some cases as well. So um, thanks very much for your attention, and uh, um, take questions if there's time. In terms of like the, the, the crawler is sending so many requests to the server that it's slowing down. I haven't actually, no. Um, yeah, I haven't looked at that. Um, I guess it would take, um, I mean, you have to have a way of sort of figuring out what the load of the crawlers are on that site. I suppose you could do that certainly by standing up a bunch of sites yourself and, and looking at that. We haven't done that, but yeah, that, that, would, be, that would be interesting to look at. Are the lines going to start to get blurry with, with the numbers when we get to things like these, these massively large corporate games like Coursera and edX and stuff where you may have um, a huge amount of outlay going from a legitimate source? Oh, are you, so uh, I'm trying to make, draw, so like connect the dots to with the MOOCs, sorry. Or to, you know, to detect <coughs> Looking at the numbers of you know things are you know there's you see there's more things coming out from from one source than than another is. Oh, okay. So I'm um, um, so I think um, uh, is the is the question that like. With with content being distributed in various places, that's going to cause changes in traffic patterns. Um, uh, that that's okay. So one question is, you know, to what extent is that true? Um, because like even a lot of these con uh, even these content and service providers tend to host their content in a few places. Like there are these big hosting farms. So one question is, to what extent is the content actually being being you know sent from a, a many different places? And I would say that actually the trend is probably the opposite. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are other questions that one could ask if the opposite were true. Um, some of those things we could maybe even use to our advantage. Yeah. Question. The uh, spam were actually announcing the slash eights. Yeah. Were they actually determining uh, of the slash eights the uh, parts that were free, or are they just sending from wherever and getting backscattered to the other? They were actually so they were actually sending from dark space. Yeah. Okay. And so, so they actually had easier <coughs> beats, so they determined what dark space. Well, so actually you can figure it out from the registry, right? So you know, for example, that so, you know that a slash a slash eight is allocated. That's a good sign, right? But then. You can figure out, like, you can figure out from both the BGP announcements and the sub allocations, like, oh, this has been allocated to Aaron, like the North American registry, <coughs> but no ISP has snapped it up yet. So it's allocated, which is great because it means people are not filtering it, right? And yet, um, you, that means you can advertise it, but yet no one's using it. So, yeah, let's go back here. With, uh, with Bismarck, as I understand it, that there's uh, limited control you have over who's going to deploy your and so, to what extent does that affect your ability to draw conclusions, given that it's not a random sample in any way? So it definitely affects the, the conclusions one can draw if you're looking at sort of user behavior. I mean, I think basically, you know, we're, we have a very special demographic. Um, as far as um, uh, perform so as far as performance of ISPs and things like that, I think 
Um, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, like, I'm not sure. Well, so I'm trying to think of like what kinds of correlations we could expect that might affect. One might be that like, um, particularly if we're looking at wireless, right, inside the home and the stuff that I showed there, people might have more of a clue as to like where to put the router, right? Um, so we may be less likely in some cases to see poor, poor wireless performance because you know they haven't thrown it under the couch, as is a common deployment uh, scenario for many people. Uh, so that's one. That's one thing to you know the, the you know where the results may be affected. I think another case where it might be especially affected. I didn't talk about a study we did where we looked at like you know actual user behavior. Where are what sites are people going to? And like, do they actually? I buy a 10 megabit per second link. Do I actually use it? <clears throat> you know, um, depends on who you are. So, so those those user behavior questions would be very you know suspect. I think in in, in our deployment. Um, people have done um, <clears throat> user studies of user behavior using this stuff, and in those cases, they've done very like careful recruiting actually. But you can't just do it on the on the whole test bed. <clears throat> so the the thing where you said you know, as soon as a name gets registered, what, what fraction of the world starts looking it up? Yeah. So was that from people getting the spam and then clicking through and then visiting the site, or is that some so we don't know. So we don't know if it's either. We could either be. Uh, it could either be uh, victims clicking through, or, or um, it, it could also be testing, right? So we actually don't know. Um, it could be either of these. So there's an interesting. Uh, I don't know if there's time to, to to get into it, but there's an interesting tweak on that too, which is that because we're looking from the top level, you would think that like most DNS resolvers cache, right? Um, so this is a study that we could actually do because the domains are new. So there's, there's some interesting stuff there as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.